Tick tock, time to rock. How is everyone doing this evening or morning or afternoon, wherever you are in the world? Um, I'm in, what state am I in? Georgia? That's Georgia. Right. I'm in Georgia with my friend Tim Stratton and my friend Dr. Mike Lacona. It, look at this. This guy said, hang on. <laughs> look at look at the complainers here. Cliff Wilson, you're late. We're one minute late. Come on. We're actually one minute late. <laughs> so I'm trying to show these guys how to use the programs. I'm here with Mike and Tim um, who need to up their game on YouTube, right? They've got great content, but... There's content, and then there's getting your content out to the world. Tim, yeah. before we get started, introduce you. Just, just explain how my recent words in Israel changed your <laughs> life forever. Yeah, well, my name is Tim Stratton. I have a website called freethinkingministries.com. I love to blog and podcast, things like that. But uh, the three of us were in Israel together not long ago, along with many others. And, you know, Dave started picking on me. He's like, hey, Stratton, 2008 called. They want their blogs back. When are you going to become a YouTube rock star like me? And, you know, I was convicted. I felt the Holy Spirit, along with Dave Wood, convict me that, hey, you know, I need to up my game and join the YouTube world. So I came all the way here to meet with Dave so he could give me some pointers. So here you go. So, yeah, uh, back in 2008, I was blogging, too. And just to be clear, <laughs> no, it, it's good to... Uh, uh, there are people who go to blogs. I, you know, I'll, I'll go, to, go to blogs to look things up and stuff like that. And I really need to start posting on my blog again, but it's good to diversify, That's right. right? It's I good agree. to diversify. So you post stuff on on, on, on on YouTube and on your blog, and then you're, uh, you're rocking that stuff. Um, so this is, uh, again, Tim Stratton, Free Thinking Ministries, linked to his channel, which, how have you been using your channel up until now if you haven't really been on YouTube? Like, yeah. you like a place to store videos That's or something? That's exactly right. Just so I could put videos on my website. Uh, so, I, yeah, I had a a YouTube channel here that really nobody knew about. So stay tuned. It's going to be officially kind of relaunched soon. But hey, I'd love to have you subscribe to uh, what I've got going right now. Just uh, search for Free Thinking Ministries. No, the link's in the, link's in the description oh, box. There you you go. don't need okay. to search for anything. All right, good. All right, so um, so go ahead and uh, if you want, then you can... Well, basically... No, no, no. Wait, wait, wait. See if you like some of his responses that he gives no, tonight during right the Q&A. No, and then no. if you think, hey, I like this guy, <laughs> then click on there, understanding that up until now, he's kind of just been using YouTube to store his videos, right. but that he's going to be, he's going to be uh, focusing more mm -hmm. on YouTube here in the near future. So then you, can, then you can be ready for it. All right. And we have as well, Mike Lacona. How are you doing, Mike? Hey, doing just great. Great to have you. Thanks for coming on down to Georgia and visiting with us and showing us some of the ins and outs of uh, YouTube. Yeah, we're doing YouTube, the master with We're it. doing YouTube tutorials. I told people recently we're going to build a, an online apologetics empire. We're going to get a bunch of people uh, posting on YouTube and all this stuff. And so that's uh, it's one of the cool things to do this year. Gonna 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 run everything. Gonna run everyone through <laughs> YouTube training. And get everyone even see there are people you know they're, they're they're apologists who write lots of stuff they're apologists who go around speaking um there are there are youtube apologists and people like me who focus all their all their attention on youtube uh, but basically whatever you're gonna wherever your energy is focused if you're using youtube at all you might as well use it well so that's what we want for everyone this year um look at this look at this hang on i'm just focusing on some of these complaints first of all we have where is sam <laughs> Who cares where Sam is? He's probably sitting in front of his screen crying that he's not with me because he's <laughs> jealous and he's always been jealous of Mike Lacona. And he's always looked up to Mike Lacona as the greatest New Testament scholar and historical Jesus scholar on the planet. And so Sam is probably in tears right now trying to, uh, trying to figure out why he's not on here. And Sam, it's easy. It's because... You suck it, you too. All right. <laughs> now you heard it. Um, one sec. We'll, we want to hear more from you real quick. We're just trying to get through a few of these initial comments. Um, Fred Sanford says, can you repeat the live chat rules, please? Thank you. Um, if you're talking about uh, whether people should be banned or something like that, um, 
basically if people are in the if people are in the comments section and they're really nasty and not focusing on the comment not fo focusing on anything and trying to distract people and so on you want to give them a time out at first and 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 warn them um if uh if people are like insulting others not really contributing anything you want to give more leeway to like muslims and you do you know to christians right if, if a christian's in here and he's just being a jerk well he should know better um, if it's a Muslim or an atheist, you might want to give them a little more leeway, give them a warning or something like that. But guys, you know, come on, we're, we, we should be here to, to kind of, you know, get along and have fun and not be, not be, uh, not be so darn negative all the time. With that said, we understand that people are going to disagree with us. So they're free to disagree with us. They're free to, uh, they're free to argue. They're free to disagree with us and respond and things like that. So it's, it's, you're basically looking for people who are, who are nasty or cursing or something like that. And then, yeah. All right. Um, wait, Richard said, David in Georgia, you should almost feel like you went home. I grew up in Tennessee and I felt at home there. Um, my, my dad was from Georgia. His whole family was from uh, Georgia. So, yeah, I spent a lot of time down here. Um, all right. So, Mike. Mike Lacona. Guys, uh, if you don't know Mike Lacona, Mike and I actually go way, 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 way back. So I knew Mike before I knew my wife. And then I knew Nabil before I knew my wife, but I knew Mike before I knew Nabil. So I got out of prison in the year 2000 and I met Mike uh, sometime shortly after that. And then I met Nabil after that. And if you, if you read Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus, you're actually, you've actually read some about Mike or if you've listened to Nabil's uh, testimony, because uh, since I knew Mike, then there was, there was a time when I asked Nabil, we were at school, we were in the room uh, where we had our, our speech and debate meetings, and I was talking to Nabil and I asked him, I said, what would, what would actually bother you if you found it out, right? What would, what, would, what would bother you about Islam? What would make you start to doubt Islam if you found out that it was true? I was thinking in terms of evidence, right? Like, oh, if I found out Muhammad did such and such, then I would start to doubt Islam. But he gave a completely different kind of answer. He said, if I saw my dad kind of backed into a corner and he couldn't respond and someone refuted my dad, then I would then I would start I would start being concerned about Islam because said he said he, he had a, he had a lot of confidence in uh, his dad teaching him over the years. And so anyway, I thought that was interesting. The reason I thought that was interesting is it wouldn't it wouldn't matter to me at all if anyone in my family was backed into a corner on something like that. It's not it's not where uh, my confidence in what I believe was did not rest on on my family and so on. So when he said that. Um, basically I knew that, uh, Mike Lacona works with Gary Habermas. And so they're, they they both spend a lot R right now. Mike's one of the top guys in the world on the resurrection. Back then he was a little more up and coming, but he was, uh, he had studied under Gary Habermas, the master and Gary Habermas was coming down. And so I went to Nabil one day and I said, uh, I said, Hey, Nabil, um, you know, it'd be cool. Why don't you and your dad come over uh, and we'll, you know, I know this guy and he studies, you know, he studies the resurrection and he, and he works with Gary who studies the resurrection. Maybe we'll get together and study, you know, have, have a discussion about the resurrection. You bring your dad and so on. And so the idea was that Nabil had already told me that if he saw his dad back to, sort of backed into a corner, that would bother him. So brought, brought uh, uh, Nabil and his dad came over to Mike Lacona's house. And so anyway, if you are familiar with that, with that story, then that's this guy. So, Mike, what got you interested in uh, apologetics? We're, guys, we're going to be taking uh, questions and uh, uh, responding to so, stuff and so on. Uh, right now, we just want to make sure because uh, before we actually went live, I saw people asking who these guys who these guys were. And I know some of you, you know Mike, and I'm sure some of you know uh, Tim as well. But for those who don't, we want to have some, some introduction. So, Mike, why don't you tell us how you got interested in apologetics and so on? Yeah, it was the fall of 1985. I was finishing my final semester of coursework for my uh, master's degree in New Testament studies. And I just started to ask myself the question, how do I know this stuff is true? I'd been born into a Christian family and uh, Christianity is really the only worldview I knew. I mean, I heard of other religions, worldviews, atheism, Islam, Buddhism, etc. But I really didn't know much at all about them. You know, I figured if I'd been born in India, I'd be a Hindu. If I'd been born in Afghanistan, I'd be a Muslim. Um, I believed I had a relationship with Christ, with God. Um, I, was, I was spending probably two hours a day in prayer at that point and several hours a day reading scriptures. I was learning to read it in its original language, uh, the New Testament, that is in Greek. 
Um, and so I just asked myself, you know, am I just brainwashing myself? Do I really know that this stuff is true? And uh, so I started to doubt my faith for the first time. Uh, I got uh, one of my roommates suggested I go see Gary Habermas. So I knocked on the door of his office. He invited me in. I mean, he didn't put me down at all or anything like that. He just said, hey, you know, there are lots of people who doubt. He told me he had doubted at one point. But then he started to go through the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. And he said, if Jesus rose, Christianity is true. That kind of settled my uh, doubts for that moment. I was just looking for an answer, someone to reassure me that Christianity was true, and Gary did. Mm -hmm. But later on, I started to doubt again. And I went through various periods of doubt. And um, even into my, my doctoral work on the resurrection of Jesus, as I was studying the philosophy of history, I've done a lot of work on the philosophy of history and uh, research with it. And I started to, to, to recognize that I had my own biases. I wanted Christianity to be true. I wanted the resurrection of Jesus to be confirmed. And this had a very, uh, th this wasn't good in an investigation on the resurrection of Jesus because it could compromise the integrity of my research. Um, and so I, I just, um, I, I worked out things just, I, I was just obsessed with doing as an objective research uh, project on the resurrection of Jesus as was possible for me. Nobody can be 100% objective. We all have what we want, um, but really what we want is truth. And if Christianity is false, I wanted to know that. I didn't want it to be false, but if it is false, I wanted to know that. And so uh, <laughs> it, it took me a lot longer to get my doctorate because uh, the average doctoral dissertation is 60 to 80,000 words. Mine was over 250,000. So whereas a um, in graduate school, a term paper that was 20 pages, double spaced with a few footnotes was a nightmare to me. Mine was you know, well over 500 pages, single spaced and over 2000 footnotes. Um, so that's what led me into apologetics. It was my own doubts. Um, I needed them resolved and I didn't, uh, in the end, it wasn't pat answers that I wanted. I didn't want to just be re reassured that what I believed was true. I wanted to get to the bottom of things. I wanted to know whether it really was true, no matter where it led. Mm -hmm. Hmm. All right. Uh, well, that's cool. I'm going to ask uh, uh, Tim the same question because keep in mind, lots of, lots of people become Christians. Who most The vast majority of people become uh, Christians who are raised Christians, don't decide to go into uh, kind of what we do, um, you know, constant, endless uh, discussions of, of the evidence and so on. So uh, it's good to find out why. Uh, we're going to take a couple quick comments uh, real quick first, and then we're going to go back to Tim. Uh, Chris Claus here says, Chris, are you related to Santa? <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sorry. I'm sure you get that all the time. Um, uh, Chris said uh, in the super chat, God bless you. Question for Mike Lacona. Do you still feel looking at the Gospels as historical biographies is the best way to view them. I do. Yeah, absolutely. You know, there's a lot of work that has been done over the years. Um, both classicists and New Testament scholars view the Gospels as ancient biographies, or at minimum that they share a lot in common with ancient biography. Back then, genres were fluid. They could blend in with one another um, and, and cross lines. So, yeah, I think we have good reasons to believe that the Gospels are ancient biographies and that they intended to report accurate history. Mm -hmm. And uh, guys, just so you, so you know, again, Mike uh, uh, will probably talk a little bit more about his background, but he's a, he's a historical Jesus scholar. So um, he studies this way, way, way more than I do. So this would be a good time for uh, questions along those lines. Um, Mike, up here we have an uh, interesting comment here. Jude Augustine said, hey, David, I like you, but I disagree with you uh, with your video about India's. Hmm. Uh, I am Indian and a Catholic. It's pretty safe. Come here and see. Stop judging from there. Uh, Jude, um, here's, here's my concern. Uh, one, I would have to wonder if you, if you watched my video, because I acknowledge that Christians and Hindus get along very well in certain areas, and that in certain areas there don't seem to be any problems. I pointed out that in other areas of Hindus, Churches are being burned down. Christians are being killed and so on. Now, so if, if you're disagreeing with that and you're saying that this doesn't happen, that there aren't, there aren't places where churches are being destroyed and vandalized and there aren't places where, where Christians are being killed. If you're saying that, then 
that's pretty interesting, but you'd have to take that up with the New York Times, the BBC, um, NDTV, all these different networks, and some, some of them Indian, some of them Western, um, that are actually putting up pictures of burning churches and cars that have been torched and so on. And uh, you're going to have to show that these guys are just flat out making all of this stuff up. And if you're going to do that, then I'd be interested in hearing that because you'd be you'd be exposing uh, some gross blunders from from the media. But Mike, you 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 happen to know some people who know yeah. quite a bit about. I have a board member. situation. I have a board member. He's so, a physician here in the United States. He's, one of your friends. You know someone personally. He's a close friend. Mm -hmm. um, he's from India, born in India, raised in India. Um, he practices medicine over here now. Um, but uh, he became a Christian. He he, he was a Brahmin. He's Brahmin. And uh, became a Christian. He says he cannot return to India now. And his mom became a Christian and is uh, experiencing some persecution right now over in India. So, yeah, Christians are being persecuted. Now, I don't know the full story, but I've been told that the, pre the current president of India has said he wants to wipe out Christianity from India in the near future. Yeah, well, so... Uh... Yeah, Jude, um, again, in, in order to, we kind of know too many people who are, are, are saying, no, there is, there is persecution over here. So again, the, the, the only way I can see of reconciling the information that we're aware of is that it's okay in certain areas and not okay in other areas. So if you're saying, no, that's wrong, it's okay in all areas, please, please explain. Um, question from Candace. Candace said, are there any specialties or niches where you see a need for a Christian apologist to step in via YouTube and social media? Um, both these guys could, could come in if there's any areas they'd like to see people go into. Uh, I'll say what, what I would like to see, what I'd like to see is people focusing on sort of, sort of particular individuals, right? In other words, if there's an atheist that you watch and you you know you you think there needs to be more responses to him, focus on that guy. And whenever that guy posts something, like like put it this way, there are tons of Muslims who dedicate their entire channels to responding to me, right? Like everything I say, they'll post stuff. Uh, they usually don't even understand what I'm saying, and they usually misrepresent it. That's fine, but um, uh, it is interesting that that they understand. Hey, here's a guy. Here's a guy. Let's 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 keep focusing responses on him. That could be the case with sort of every, you know, important Muslim apologist on YouTube or every important uh, atheist uh, uh, apologist on YouTube. Um, if there were people on YouTube who are responding to everything these guys kind of put out, then you, you've kind of got all the, all the bases covered. In other words, I cannot respond to everyone. There's too much stuff being put out. But if there were 50 Christians and they were focusing on 50 different people, then you've got everything covered, right? You've got responses yeah. to everyone. Uh, what do you guys think on that? Any, uh, any particular topics or stuff? You Well, I agree with Dave. Uh, I have to say that probably Sam Harris was a guy that I was focusing on that kind of launched Free Thinking Ministries. He came out with a book called Free Will in which he concludes that we don't have free will. And uh, that really got me thinking. And just, uh, you know, I wanted to go on a mission to see if that was true. And and so uh, that's why we I started Free Thinking Ministries. I do believe that we have free will. I also think that uh, we can deductively prove that. Uh, and I think the best explanation for the fact that humans have free will is uh, the existence of God. In fact, I think it's uh, the biblical view of God. Uh, I argue for that. But there's also other atheists that I, I like to interact with. Uh, Mike does the same thing. He's got a, a handful of guys that he's really kind of focused on interacting with. And uh, Mike, why don't you share a little bit about that too? No. Oh. Yeah, well, I do agree with both of you. Um, and it's hard to know who to, 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 to go, you know, after. Uh, mm -hmm. I guess you just have to, to take on who you want to. But several years ago, I know Bart Ehrman was having a, a big impact. He still is. Uh, probably the most influential, skeptical New Testament scholar in the world today. And, you know, he's, he's a really good communicator. He's very persuasive. I wasn't uh, persuaded by his arguments. And... Um, so I, I uh, years ago I started I did a few reviews of his book, some of his books, and um, also ended up debating him a few times. We have since become friends. Mm -hmm. I respect Bart. We get along really well. We disagree on things, but we we have a friendship. Um, so then that's been kind of interesting how that has happened. But I value that friendship. Mm -hmm. 
So, um, you know, and it's neat. We can disagree with people. We can challenge what they're saying. He can challenge what I'm saying. Uh, I think as long as we do it respectfully, yeah. we, can, um, we can get along pretty well. But it takes two to do that. Bart's willing to do that. I'm willing to do that. And perhaps you guys can find someone uh, who's willing to do that and you're willing to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so guys, I, I would say uh, two ways to go. Either, either focus on what you're really interested in or focus on something where you, you, you just, you notice that there aren't enough people right. responding to it. One of the main reasons I am still dealing with Islam is I've never thought there were enough people dealing with the topic, mm -hmm. right? I mean, when, when I was getting started in apologetics, almost everything was geared towards atheism. When I'm sitting there thinking, gosh, you've got this ideology with uh, well over a billion followers. And there just were very few people uh, focusing on that. And so uh, find something you're, you're, you're interested in or passionate about or find something where you're looking at it. And even if you're not necessarily focused on that, you understand there just aren't a pe there aren't a lot of people responding to it. Uh, a couple of super chats here. Hannah says, um, thank you for what you do. Third time watching the live stream and it's helping me. Uh, that's cool. We'll keep watching. We're going to have a uh, uh, by the way, today we're just we're just we're. Uh, we're just kind of doing a Q&A, but if you want us to address a, a specific topic over the next couple of days that has something to do, especially with the areas that these guys deal with. So Mike deals with a lot of, uh, again, historical Jesus studies, things like that. Tim, what are your what are your favorite topics again that you deal with? Uh, primarily free will and the implications of that topic. Um, I also, when it comes to Christian theism, uh, I argue for a view called Molinism. Uh, namely mere Molinism is a focus of uh, what I did my uh, PhD dissertation work on. And so I like to argue for the, or tell people about the apologetic significance of Molinism. And if you're a Christian and a Christian apologist, why you should also be a Molinist when you do apologetics works. But this is one of the things that I uh, find interesting. I don't yeah. expect all Christians to find it interesting or to agree with me, but I find it a fascinating topic. We might want to we might want to uh, do just a whole live stream on like uh, free will issues. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So yeah, we might do that before before I leave here. Uh, Gene Wallace in the super chat says Jesus saves the rest enslaved. Amen. Uh, Harley says uh, Plantinga argues that the proof for the resurrection can bolster faith but never ground it. Knowledge of God is given by divine action uh, thoughts. So what do you think about that? Ah. Well, you know, I, I know Planica is a great mm -hmm. philosopher and, you know, he's going to be able to talk about <laughs> some things that's just going to lose me. OK, mm -hmm. one, of the, um, one of the just to be clear, one of the greatest philosophers of all time. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, and what and, and uh, certainly one of the greatest philosophers of, of our generation. So I would just say, look, I think most of us recognize I think most people recognize that if Jesus rose from the dead, Christianity is true, period. Right. Mm -hmm. I remember after my debate with Shabir Ali back at, at Regent University in 2000, uh, was it four? Um, I was there with the bill. You were sitting side by side with uh, the bill and when, after, when he was still a Muslim. And you took Shabir to see the passion of I the took Christ. Shabir to see the passion of the Christ. I, mess, oh. I messaged him ahead of time and I was like, hey, you guys are doing a debate on the resurrection. Uh, the movie might come up because the movie just came out. Uh, so if you want to see it, I'd be happy to take you there. And so I actually picked him up when he was uh, uh, coming out of the mosque to give a presentation. That's where I met Shabir and I took him out to get some food and then um, uh, took, him, yep, took him to see the Passion of the Christ. So I remember after the debate, you were walking out with Gary Habermas. Mm -hmm. And I think Gary had a graduate assistant with him that he brought. Um, and you were walking ahead of Nabil and I, we came out of the auditorium, we're walking down into the parking lot. And I remember Nabil saying, uh, you know, Mike, you did really well tonight. I think you won the debate. And he said, I think Christianity does have some good evidence. So does Islam. But he said, the only thing I think you Christians have over Islam is the resurrection of Jesus. And That's I remember, it. I said, That's uh, it, folks. <laughs> Nabil, did you hear what you just said? Because if Jesus rose from the dead, it's game, set, match. Christianity's true, period. And he said, well, yeah, you're probably right there. And then I said, hey, Doc, Gary, come here. Nabil, tell Gary what you just told me. You remember that? Mm -hmm. And then he came down and we all talked about it for a little. So if we're going to talk about grounded and whatever, whatever I don't, I'm not sure in what sense that Planaga is referring it to. I would just say, if Jesus rose from the dead, we are on good grounds for believing that Christianity is true. 
And there's really good evidence to think that Jesus rose from the dead. Now, if we go through some philosophical and scientific arguments for God's existence, does that bolster the case? Sure. But I do think that just looking at the resurrection itself, the evidence for it, the historical case, gives us adequate reason, more than adequate, to believe that Christianity is true. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, now, if, if, uh, just to be clear, Harley, if you're talking about, like, you know, saving knowledge of the truth or something like that, obviously we believe that the Holy Spirit, right, that, that we, we, the Holy Spirit is the one who does that, and that we can't come to Jesus unless we're drawn by the Father. And so, uh, if you're talking about that, but, I mean, guess what? People can look at the evidence for the resurrection, conclude that Jesus rose from the dead, and then conclude, well, gosh, if I'm going to listen to anyone tell me about God, I'm probably going to listen to that guy. Um, do you have anything you want to add, or should we go to some more? Yeah, let's just keep it going. Keep going? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, all right, so Jared, uh, question for Mike. What is the best evidence for the resurrection today? You're going to have to encapsulate this. We'll, prob we'll probably do something again here in the next couple of days if, uh, in case. So if I'm going to spend a day, uh, one live stream with, um, with Tim discussing... Uh, discussing free will issues, then maybe one day you can basically take everyone through the modern research on the resurrection. So, but if you're if you're given it in a nutshell, what would you say? I'd say the best evidence or best or simplest way to present it is, you know, there are a number of facts, and I say facts in the sense that uh, these are strongly supported items that are strongly supported by the data and so strongly supported that even a nearly a universal majority of scholars today will grant them as facts, whether they're atheist, agnostic, Jewish scholars, uh, whatever, they all will you know, acknowledge these. These would be things like Jesus' death by crucifixion, that shortly after a number of his followers had experiences that persuaded them Jesus had been raised from the dead and had appeared to them. Um, and uh, you've got Paul, <clears throat> who had been a persecutor of the church, and then he becomes a Christian when he has an experience he believes was the risen Jesus who had appeared to him. So, I mean, if you just take those three facts, which are granted by nearly 100% of scholars across the board today. Now, of course, you're always gonna get someone who disagrees, like say, Jesus never existed. You even have Holocaust deniers. You have people who mm -hmm. say we never landed on the moon. So you're never gonna get 100%. But I'm talking about bona fide scholars in the relevant field, nearly 100% would agree on all three of those facts. Now, what, the, what a historian has to do is formulate hypotheses to account for those facts and then choose the hypothesis that best explains those. Which one explains all of them? Which one explains them without forcing them to fit? Which one explains them without some sort of uh, great amount of speculation involved? Uh, given our background knowledge, which one of them uh, explains these facts the best? And the resurrection hypothesis by far explains those three facts better than any competing hypothesis. Mm -hmm. So that's how I, I in a nutshell, mm -hmm. I think is the best. Uh, it, it may not be the strongest way you could add some other things, but I think it's something that where we can all come together and say, okay, we can agree on these facts. Now, what's the best explanation of these facts? And then we can, you know, discuss that. Mm -hmm. That's how I would, that's a simple way to argue for the resurrection. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dapper Dave in the super chat says, "Strange request. Uh, can you dedicate a video that addresses the appeal of Islam from the Quran? The appeal of Islam from the Quran. I would like to be better uh, having a conversation with a person of that faith to explain that Christianity is the way to go." Thanks. Uh, as far as the most people who convert to Islam, it has nothing to do with the Quran. They hear stuff about Islam and about what it teaches, usually completely misrepresented. Uh, Muslim preachers will adapt the message to whatever people happen to like or believe in an area. So if you're uh, if you're all about feminism, they will adapt the message of Islam so that it's a complete feminist message. Uh, whatever 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 you believe in, they will adapt it for you to get you to convert. Um, as far as the Quran, there are occasionally people who are are impressed by the Quran and and convert on that basis. It's it's, it's usually. Um, just this this constant uh, you know emphasis on God and worshiping God and um, and as well as incorporating a lot of the the biblical figures right a, a lot of the prophets that they're familiar with and so on as well as Jesus and so the reading about so it's usually people who have some sort of problem already with 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 Christianity but who are raised as Christians uh, and so they're looking for an alternative and then Islam comes along and says, hey, we're the alternative here. Look at the Quran. Uh, you already believe in all these guys, uh, but Islam is better. And so people convert uh, on those grounds. But that, that's kind of the only, uh, it's kind of the only 
thing that I would find that someone might, uh, that I'm aware of, that someone would, you know, study the Quran and, and come to believe in Islam. Uh, I, again, there are people who will say, oh, it's because of the miraculous eloquence of the Quran, or it's because of the amazing scientific insights of the Quran. Those people usually aren't basing it on the actual Quran. They're basing it on what people say about the Quran. So uh, it's kind of a different category. Um, all right, so Dapper Dave, all right, we're going to flip over to Tim right now. Uh, I said we were going to have Tim explain how he, why he decided to get involved in apologetics when there's lots of people who, who don't go that route. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I was uh, raised in a Christian family, raised going to church. I took it for granted. I basically thought everybody was raised that way. Um, and you know, eventually I became a youth pastor. I thought that was, you know, the, just the, the right thing to do. But after being in youth ministry for a while, uh, you know, a couple of years into it, I remember a young man tapping me on the shoulder. He'd been in my Bible study for a couple of years. Uh, he was the son of one of the elders in my church. And he tapped me on the shoulder right before youth group started. It's the beginning of his junior year. Had him since he was a freshman. And he said, Tim, I just wanted to come and let you know face to face, I'm not coming back to youth group this year. Uh, and I said, oh, that's too bad. Are you going to a different church now? And he goes, no. And I said, well, are you going to come, keep coming to Bible study? He goes, no, I, I'm not coming back to church. I'm not coming to Bible study. Uh, I became an atheist over the summer. I've been watching YouTube videos with uh, Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris and Christopher Hitchens and Stephen Hawking and fill in the blank with your favorite atheist. And, and he said, they've convinced me that that book that you've had us studying is nothing but a bunch of fairy tales. I believe them and God does not exist. And I said, dude, you know that's not true. You've seen it, you've read it in the Bible. Paul tells Timothy that every word is God breathed. It's the inspired word of God. And he said, yeah, but I don't believe that that's true. And I said, yeah, but it's in the word of God. And he said, but why should I think it's in the word of God? And I said, because it says it's the word of God. Paul tells Timothy that and he goes, Tim, that's begging the question. That's a logical fallacy. This is a 16 year old and I didn't even know what a logical fallacy was at that time. And he said, tell you what, Tim, if you can answer one of my questions or objections, I'll stick around. And I don't know for sure, it's probably give me a dozen from which to choose and guess how many I can answer? Zero. Mm. And he looked at me with a look I'll never forget, with disappointment and uh, I felt like I just really let him down. He even had a little bit of tears in his eyes. And he just looked at me, he was just disgusted with me. And almost as if he was saying, you call yourself a youth pastor. And he turned around and walked out of the doors of the church. I'll never forget it. Yeah. And some of those objections, man, they were pretty good. At least I thought they were at the time. It kind of shook me a little bit, kind of rocked my faith. I didn't know what to do. I went home that night and with that shaken faith, I prayed and I, I said, God, what do I do here? I, I never felt like I was the smart kid in school and he's raising all these questions, you know, and, and objections for everyone from physicists to philosophers. And I was like, I can't contend with those. And I felt like God was telling me, man, if you're going to be a shepherd, you got to learn how to defend the sheep. And I didn't know how to do that. So uh, a colleague of mine gave me a book called Reasonable Faith by William Lane Craig. And I uh, started Googling him and I found, you know, I was watching his debates. I found some guy named Mike Lacona uh, reading his stuff. And man, my, my faith was just being strengthened and I was learning how to answer these questions. Eventually I wanted to go to Biola University so I could learn from these guys. And uh, it's just been a, a fantastic ride. My mind has been transformed. Um, and uh, so that's how I got into apologetics. I realized that there were so many high school students and college students that I was working with who were losing their faith. And even if they were keeping their faith, their faith was getting rocked too. And I realized they had real questions, uh, genuine questions that needed answered. And uh, I felt like God was calling me to, to answer these questions. And it's been a fun journey. But that's how I got into the field of apologetics and philosophy and now systematic theology, too. So. Well, speaking of philosophy. Braxton Hunter here. Braxton. Is Cartesian certainty attainable or necessary in historical studies or philosophy or anything else? Uh, I'll, I'll just say quickly here at the beginning. Um, yeah, I think you can have Cartesian certainty in certain areas that, that Descartes said that you can have them in, like my own existence, right? There are there are philosophers who will deny this, right? Mm -hmm. I, I think it was Hume who said, uh, 
Um, no, you can't conclude that you exist from thinking. You just conclude that thinking exists, right? Uh, so you do have people who would object to it. I think it's silly. Uh, if I'm thinking, I obviously exist, and I think I'm absolutely certain uh, about that. There is the question, though, of whether you'd have uh, that kind of certainty in different fields like mm -hmm. history and so on. What do you guys, what do you guys think? Yeah, I agree. I mean, uh, it seems obvious that I can know a certainty that I exist. I'm not sure about my body <laughs> or, or this guy. Yeah. Yeah, um, I can run thought experiments, you know, maybe I'm in some kind of a matrix or a brain in a bat or something like that. But, but it's obvious that the, the thing that I, the, the thing that I call I <laughs> exists, I'm a thinking thing. And even if I don't have a body, even if I don't have a brain, I'm a thinking thing. And uh, so that seems uh, certain. Um, but yeah, I think there's very few things that we can have that kind of certainty uh, with. Mm -hmm. But I think we can know many things with extremely high degrees of certainty. And as Mike likes to point out, we can know that the resurrection of Jesus occurred with extremely high degrees of historical certainty. And so, uh, yeah, I, uh, I would agree. Um, there's very few things we can know with 100% certainty, but I do know I exist. And that doesn't mean that I don't possess knowledge of these other things. I have real knowledge that God exists. I'm, in fact, I'd say I'm certain that God exists. Uh, but I don't like putting numbers. I don't think we have to put uh, numbers on things like that. I just say I, I, I possess knowledge mm -hmm. that Christianity is true. Mm -hmm. uh, Mike, what are your thoughts on that? Well, first, uh, there is one thing I can know for certain is that Braxton Hunter is an awesome guy. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, I love we Braxton. Agree. He's a great friend, one of my dearest friends, really a great guy, cool guy. Uh, I'd encourage all the viewers here to plug into his station uh, at Trinity, Trinity Radio. He's just a great guy. Let me add that Braxton is also now a, a new regular contributor on freethinkingministries.com, so you can follow his work there. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, he's a great guy. Mm -hmm. uh, that said, I would also add that um, uh, when it comes to historical work, there's no way that you're going to get absolute certainty, Cartesian certainty, when it comes to uh, historical conclusions, especially when you go into the past. You know, all historians can do is look at the data that has come down to us, formulate hypotheses, and, and uh, make conclusions that are based on varying degrees of certainty and every one of our conclusions are provisional. In other words, we'd say it could have been otherwise. Now that is in terms of historical conclusions. Um, that can have a great deal of certainty, but we're not gonna have absolute certainty. But you know, very few things in life we have absolute certainty about. And as I heard one person said, if we wait until all the lights are green before we head into town, we're going to spend the rest of our lives at home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I would add that. Uh, uh, yeah, we, we we normally don't demand uh, absolute certainty uh, for for pretty much anything, right? I mean, are are you absolutely certain that that someone's not going to axe murder you as soon as you walk out your house? Um, no, you, someone might do that stuff, but you don't you don't live your life based on uh, things you're absolutely certain about. Uh, one thing is interesting, though. I think there are lots of uh, atheists who sort of make their career out of demanding absolute certainty uh, in certain areas, right? In, in other words, if you give them and, an, uh, you know, uh, if they use an argument like the problem of evil, and they say, hey, my argument proves this, um, then, you know, even if you can point out 12 different problems with the argument, you're still supposed to accept the argument because, gosh, there's, there's just so much suffering in the world, right? Um, but if you're giving a design argument or a cosmological argument or something like that, if they can find any way out, no matter how ridiculously improbable, even if even if the only odds of them being right is one in 10 to the 257th power, something like that, they'll say, ah, there you see, your argument fails. And so the demand is actually for absolute certainty, which we, we, we have almost nowhere. So mm. uh, basically people shift their levels of skepticism in response to what they what they uh, do or do not want to believe. If someone says something that you don't want to believe, if you don't want to believe in God, well, it's very easy. You just raise your skepticism level to infinite and then say, now prove to me that God exists when no evidence is going to do it. Mm. If you want to believe in objective moral values, even though they don't fit on your worldview, well, you lower your skepticism level down to one. And now, hey, your feelings count as complete proof of the of objective morality and so on. When you would never accept someone's feelings as, as proof of the existence of God or something like that. So 
Um, yeah, we don't have, the, the only way I think you could get Cartesian certainty about something historical would be to use Descartes' method to do that. So he starts off just with knowing that he exists and then knowing that he has certain ideas and then using those ideas to make an argument for the existence of God and then arguing based on the nature of God that I can know other things because God gives me reliable uh, faculties mm -hmm. and so on. And therefore I can trust my senses. And if you, you, you might be able to go that route, but I think with, 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 Descartes' view is that since since God gave me my, my cognitive faculties, then as long as I am using them appropriately in the way God intended, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be I'm not gonna be led into error and so on. But I think even if you took that that method and you were talking about history, you could always you could always be concerned that you're not using your faculties properly. And so I don't think you'd have that level of uh, certainty. I like how you said as long as I'm using them appropriately. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's well said. Yeah. Um. Uh, here's one for Mike here. Maria says, could you consider the spiritual resurrection of Jesus, not the physical? So I think the question is here, um, something you, you, you get and you've, you've uh, debated people who have this position. Can we think of Jesus just rising spiritually rather than a physical resurrection where it's actually his, his, his body that returns to life? Does everyone, does everyone get the question? So you, Christians normally believe in a physical resurrection. Jesus was was buried in a tomb and then actually rose physically. Um, there are people who would want to argue that you no, know, it's just a, a spiritual resurrection, right? Yeah. Not not a physical one. What are your thoughts on that, Mike? Well, I think they're wrong. <laughs> you know, not only do all four gospels clearly present uh, a bodily raised Jesus that leaves behind an empty tomb. They end up talking with him. They end up are invited to touch his hands and his side where, you know, the nails and the spear had been. Um, now, someone can say, well, Paul wrote probably before all of the Gospels, and he talks about the spiritual resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15. But you got to read all of Paul. Um, I, I don't think that's what's going on in Paul. Uh, Romans 8.11 says, The Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead will also, also give life to your mortal bodies, which suggests it was to Jesus' mortal body that was given life. Uh, Philippians 3.20.21 says, um, For uh, we eagerly wait a Savior who will transform our humble bodies, transform them to be conformed to Jesus' glorious body. So it's a transformation. You read 1 Corinthians 15. It talks about, and, and, and verses 50 and following, it talks about a transformation of our bodies. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 17, uh, probably the earliest piece of literature in our New Testament. And uh, Paul says he doesn't want us to grieve as those who have no hope when we've lost a loved one because we're going to see them again. And he basically says how um, when, when Christ returns, he's going to bring back with him those who have died as believers. And then the trumpet will sound and the dead in Christ will be raised. Well, what does that mean? If he's bringing the dead in Christ back with him, how are they going to be raised then after he brings them back with him? Well, it's simple. Uh, the, the, the dead in Christ are raised in terms of their corpse are brought back to life. The spirit of that person is brought back into that corpse and then is transformed into the powerful, glorious body that's animated by the Holy Spirit as described in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Um, you have Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 uh, that, that, that says, um, uh, you know, we die and, and we're with Christ. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So again, when we die, our spirit leaves our body, goes to be with Christ in heaven. When he returns, he brings back our spirit with him. Our corpses are regenerated back to life. The spirit is returned to the body and it is um, raised, a res transformed into a resurrection body. And I, several verses, like I said, in Romans chapter 8, verse 11, 1 Corinthians uh, 15, 20, uh, Christ is the first fruits of those who sleep uh, dead. And then verse 23, each in his own order, Christ the first fruits. After that, those who return, uh, those who belong to Christ at his coming. So again, it's a, it, we go to be with Christ in spirit when we die, but the resurrection happens when of, uh, of us, bodily resurrection happens when he returns, but it's the same way he was raised in the year 30 or 33. So 
it is definitely a bodily resurrection that Paul and the Gospels refer to. A spiritual resurrection is just misconstrued. Mm -hmm. um, here's another quick one from Mike. Uh, Mike said he doesn't like reading the Old Testament. Can you clarify? What are you talking about, Mike? You're saying you don't like the Bible? What the heck is wrong with that? <laughs> yeah, I'd be happy to clarify. Um, you know, there. Uh, look, I, I like to be honest. There are some things in the Old Testament just kind of they bother me. They kind of disturb me. Um, I don't understand them. Um, but I have to admit, it's a it's, it's a different kind of literature than we have in the New Testament. I do believe that it's divinely inspired. Um, I, I I have enough trouble understanding some of the New Testament literature uh, within its context, uh, and that's why I like to study. Uh, the ancient world and understand how things were going on. I, you know, I, I ha haven't had the time to do that with the Old Testament. So yeah, there are some things that trouble me in the Old Testament, things that make me feel uncomfortable. Um, and I know that I'm just never going to get the time to be able to wrestle through them as like some of the Old Testament scholars do. I'm really focused on the New Testament. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, we have a <laughs> Ham Sunshine says, please uh, introduce Tim to vocab. You know vocab. Oh, yeah. Right? Don't you know vocab? What's up, vocab? No, no, no. He's not oh. vocab. He's saying introduce Tim to oh, vocab. Yeah, I know vocab. Yeah, he knows vocab. What are you talking about? What are you talking about, Ham Sunshine? Maybe, maybe he wants you to uh, choke vocab out or something <laughs> like that. I'm not messing with him. All right, here's one. Uh, I know it's not New Testament, but how do you counter the God of the gaps argument? You familiar with the God of the gaps argument? Yeah. Everyone know the God of the gaps argument? It goes like this. Yep. So you give some argument based on, uh, let's say, probability or something like that. Right? So you, if you talk about uh, <clears throat> DNA or the origin of life or something, and you show, hey, it, it's so improbable that these, um, these molecules went into this order on their own to form life. It's so probable that there must be a designer. And the response is, no, 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 there's a gap in our knowledge, right? There's a gap in our knowledge. We don't know how it happened. And you're trying to put God into that gap and say, God did it when we just don't know how it happened. There's a gap in our knowledge. And so you shouldn't be putting God in that gap. You should instead, uh, you should instead just wait until that, that knowledge is, is filled in. What do you think about that? Yeah, it's uh, the old, well, I can't figure it out. So God must have done it, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, I've never reasoned like that. Well, not at least since I got into apologetics and studied that. I might have as a, the old Tim, as a, the old youth pastor might have done that, which wouldn't have been good. But, um, yeah, you know, I think about arguments like the Kalam cosmological argument. And if the two premises are true, you know, anything that begins to exist has a cause and the universe began to exist. Now, those, those two premises seem to be true, right? We don't have any reason to doubt them. And all the evidence, all the data supports those two premises. So we're quite rational in saying that those two premises are true. Well, if they're true, the conclusion logically follows um, that therefore the universe has a cause. And when you think about the nature of the universe, it's all things, time and space and all things nature. Well, if nature, time and space began to exist. Now we can make some rational inferences. We're not jumping to conclusions and saying, therefore God or therefore God must have done it. Not at all. We're saying if nature, time, and space all began to exist, which is supported by the scientific data and through logic alone, if nature, time, and space began to exist, then the cause of all nature has got to be other than nature. And that just simply means supernatural. The cause of time has to be timeless. And if it's timeless, then it's also beginningless because beginnings require time. If it's spaceless, or if the cause of space had a beginning, or if space had a beginning, then whatever caused space to come into existence has to be spaceless. And if it's spaceless, then by definition, it's immaterial because matter requires space to exist in the first place. We can also conclude some other things. Uh, that whatever caused nature, time, and space to begin existing, whatever caused the entire universe to begin existing, must be extremely powerful. I can't think of anything uh, that would require more power. And ultimately, I believe, I don't have time to cash this out here, but I believe that we can, you know, since things don't happen apart from time, uh, then the universe kind of begin to exist unless it's at least the best explanation that the cause of the universe can make a volitional choice, or shall I say, the cause of the universe has free will uh, to create or not to create. And it's not caused to do something 
uh, to do so by something else because there wouldn't be anything else. Anyway, when you start looking at all these rational inferences that the cause of the universe must possess, you start looking at it, wait, timeless, that means it's eternal, uh, spaceless, therefore uh, spirit, if you will, uh, other than nature, supernatural, extremely powerful. It doesn't prove omnipotence by any means, but it sure seems to point that way. And a, a mind with free will, that only persons do that. Well, what is the best explanation of that? And this, that seems to be what we call God. Now, I, I'm not saying that, I'm not jumping to that conclusion. I'm reasoning there. I'm, I'm taking steps to reach that conclusion rationally. Those are rational inferences based on a deductive conclusion. Mm -hmm. So it's not God of, God of the gaps at all. And we can do, do that kind of reasoning with the, all of, you know, Dr. Craig calls it the cumulative case of arguments. And there's more of it than he normally uses as well. So we have good reason to think God exists and good reason to think that Christianity is true. Yeah, um, I would just add, uh, I've been planning for a while to make a video on the on the God of the gaps argument because uh, <laughs> it's been so massively misused. First thing, here's an interesting fact. It was Christians who came up with the God of the gaps argument, right? It was Christians who noticed that people were pointing to things where we couldn't figure something out and they were saying God did it. And it was Christians who pointed out, hey, some of you, some of you people who are arguing for the existence of God based on things we, you know, we just don't know enough about. Uh, you need to stop that. God is the cause of everything. Right? God is the cause of the entire universe. God is, God is the cause of, uh, of, of all of science. God is the cause of all of these things. So don't don't force don't try to force God into these little gaps. God's responsible for it all. Right. So that was their point. And then atheists <laughs> jumped onto it. Didn't really didn't really understand it. And then they they claimed they pointed out that some because some Christians were doing this right some Christians were just pointing out something that we didn't know and then claiming that you know God is the cause of it. Um, so one Christians were Christians were the ones who invented this response. So there were Christians who noticed that Christians were doing this and they called them out for doing it. Right. Um, so that's one thing too. As, as Tim's pointing out, when, when we when, when we build an argument based on the fine tuning of the cosmos or the origin of the universe or um, the, the complexity of life. We're not arguing based on our ignorance. We're arguing based on what we know. We're arguing based on this wealth of information we have and what we know about where these things tend to come from. When you see how sophisticated and complex life is, guess what? It's if all of our experience tells us where you get things that are that sophisticated and that complex. You get them from, you get them from uh, an intelligent source. Um, so those are a couple of things. Those are a couple of things I would uh, I would point out. And, and the other thing is, remember earlier when I mentioned that atheists tend to dial their skepticism up to ten when when there's an argument for the existence of God on the table and they demand complete proof and so on. And as long as you, as long as you can't give complete proof, they'll they'll reject your argument. Well, notice if you were if atheists were actually consistent with this God of the gaps argument, you could use this about anything. You could use God of the gaps argument about anything. So suppose I say right here, hey, I, I know I'm holding a, a water bottle in my hand. You say, well, no, maybe there's another explanation that you're not thinking about, right? Maybe an alien, a powerful alien is tricking you into thinking that you're holding a water bottle. You haven't considered that explanation. So quit using your water bottle of the gaps explanation, right? Like what, why do my senses tell me that there's a water bottle here? Well, I'm assuming that because a water bottle exists right here, but guess what? Something else could explain it too, right? Couldn't something else like aliens tricking me or me being dream, I'm dreaming right now. Couldn't there be other explanations? Therefore, I shouldn't believe in the evidence that I have because I could, I could imagine a gap, right? I can imagine a, a, a gap in my knowledge. The gap would be there's some other explanation that I'm not thinking about, right? So there's a gap right there. And I'm just filling it in with my belief that there's an actual bottle. Well, what happens when you put together, as, as Tim pointed out, the cumulative case for the existence of God? It looks like God is what explains all of these things. You can always say maybe there's some other explanation that I haven't thought of. And so don't put God in that gap. Um, so, yeah, problem. I got a couple questions here, unless you want to talk any more about that one. No, you can jump in. All right. So here's one from... Wait, 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 wait. For oh. First, first, look at this. Look at this. Shameless Shamoon has entered the live stream. <laughs> Why? He wasn't getting anyone watching his because no one watches his. <laughs> um, and so he has to come over here and disrupt ours, uh, hit and run, probably posted a comment and then ran uh, in order to distract everyone from the information that's being presented. You see? You see how he works? You see how he works? Gosh. 
why are there people like this? Uh, anyway, <laughs> hey Sam, uh, Sam needs attention. <laughs> Sam needs attention, so he comes over to our live stream to get attention because he can't get any attention on his own channel. All right, thank you. Sure. All right, so uh, who's this? A uh, stubbed dub asks, "Hey Tim, stubbed dub, <laughs> you said that we or you said we can find evidence for free will. This is new to me. Can you explain in a nutshell? Uh, this is a common topic with atheists. Yeah, that's right. It is a common topic uh, with atheists and also with Christians too. Uh, it was atheists who got me into this uh, topic on free will, and I, I developed some arguments, uh, namely to show that atheism was false. And then I started being attacked by Christians who said, no, we don't have free will. And so I started uh, dealing with both atheists and Christians who uh, deny free will. Uh, so uh, I, I like to have conversations with people on both sides of the theistic aisle. But um, I would recommend uh, to get started on this. I have a kind of an intro level article on my website. Uh, it's called uh, Thinking About Free Thinking. And, you know, that's why it says free think right here. So thinking about free thinking. But let me give you the nutshell argument. Um, it's just two premises and a conclusion. It says if humans are not free in the libertarian sense, they cannot either rationally infer or rationally affirm claims of knowledge. Two, humans can rationally infer and rationally affirm claims of knowledge. Three, conclusion, therefore humans are free in a libertarian sense. And I think uh, one of the best ways to explain this quickly and in a nutshell, as you asked for, is uh, to give this short uh, thought experiment. It goes like this. Suppose a mad scientist somehow gets control of your brain and he exhaustively controls and causally determines all of your thoughts and beliefs all the time. And this includes exactly what you think of and about and exactly how you think of and about it. All of your thoughts about your beliefs and all of your beliefs about your thoughts are caused and determined by the mad scientist. And this also includes the next words that will come out of your mouth. So here's a question. How can you, not the mad scientist, rationally affirm the current beliefs in your head as good, bad, better, the best, true, or probably true, and the list can go on, uh, note the range of options from which to choose without begging the question. Good luck with that. That's impossible. And if you replace the scientist with physics and chemistry, or I would even argue with God, uh, or anything else, anyone or anything else, uh, then you've got the exact same rationality problem, but for different reasons. However, since humanity does possess the ability to rationally infer and affirm knowledge claims and to, other argue, or to argue otherwise would be to affirm it, we know that we possess the libertarian freedom to think, right? Free thinking ministries. We know that we have the libertarian freedom to think and take certain steps while deciding what we ought to affirm and believe. And since libertarian freedom seems to be metaphysically impossible, if humanity is nothing but physical stuff, well, we can rationally infer then that humanity is more than just the physical. And I think the best explanation of that is uh, a soul created in the image or likeness of God. And that's why I think the best explanation, this is not deductive, this is not a deductive conclusion here, but the maybe an abductive conclusion, the best explanation uh, for the existence of libertarian free will and the human soul. Something immaterial about my uh, existence is the biblical view of God. So anyway, that's the argument in a nutshell. I've expanded it uh, to uh, show some of those other uh, conclusions as well. But Now, um, yeah, no, notice uh, uh, Tim used that as, a, as an argument for, for free will. Uh, but uh, if, you, if you notice, a lot of what he's saying uh, would should be a huge problem for for atheists right. if, if they're atheists in the in the physicalist materialist sense that mm -hmm. you know our you know the physical world is all that exists if the physical world is all that exists and everything that happens is is just strictly determined by laws of nature particles in motion and so on then every thought that i've ever thought has been determined right it was it was yeah. determined before before i was ever born right it wasn't up to you. particles particles in motion um and so going going back briefly to his example just think, if every thought that you think right now was determined by a mad science, what was every thought is you're being given those thoughts, right? So suppose you're actually a brain in a vat 
in a lab and a scientist is making you think everything around you. Um, well, that wouldn't, you wouldn't, your thoughts would not, well, one, your thoughts would not be free, two, you, you couldn't really say they were rational, they were rational thoughts, right? You wouldn't, you, yeah. you would have no way, you wouldn't even know, right? Because that would even be up to the mad scientist. Whatever yeah. you said about your thoughts, yeah. what's well, not up to you? Where did you go? That's what yeah. I want to know. And so the, 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 the mad scientist, he could give you a true belief or he could give you a false belief. You, 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 wouldn't, know you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't know. And so you can't even affirm your own, your own thought processes yeah. and so on. But notice the exact same thing would follow if all of our, our, our thought process, our thought processes were, were determined uh, by particles in motion, right? Mm -hmm. You have a belief. If I have a different belief, who's right? Well, you're determined to believe what you're, what you believe. I'm determined to believe what I believe. It's both the result of particles in motion. So how can we, how could we even trust any of our, any of our reasoning if we are just sort of particles in motion? So, and it, got some issues there, right? And and Sam Harris, I, I mentioned him earlier. Let me read a quote from his book. This is one of the things that got me started thinking about this stuff. He says, quote, free will is an illusion. Now he says this because he's an atheistic naturalist. He thinks everything is caused and determined basically by physics and chemistry or the forces of nature. So he says, free will is an illusion. Our wills are simply not of our own making. And then he says, thoughts, thoughts and intentions emerge from background causes of which we are unaware and over which we exert no conscious control. We do not have the freedom we think we have. And then he says, either our wills are determined by prior causes and we are not responsible for them, or they are the product of chance and we are not responsible for them, end quote. Now, the problem here is, and he's not even responsible for these own words, so how does he know they're any good? Uh, they were determined by, I mean, his own thoughts here that he records on paper weren't up to him. They emerged from background causes over which he was unaware and over which he exerts no conscious control. So he can assume, but guess what? That assumption is not even up to him either. Physics, physics and chemistry, according to him, caused and determined his assumption. So you, you just get into this state of vertigo. Um, and, and it should it should rock you. The state of vertigo is warranted, and you should. Re it's a good reason to reject this view. That if that you the thing you can the the thing that you call I can actually evaluate concepts like free will and and, and like uh, the resurrection or you know if you can evaluate concepts, then there's something about you that's different than the rest of the stuff in the universe. Mm -hmm. uh, you can evaluate things, even if you can evaluate it as good or bad, then you have a range of options. And, and I, I should define free will or libertarian free will very quickly. It, it, you, it, it at least means that, you, that there's no external causes when it comes to your thinking. Uh, if I'm talking about libertarian free thinking, that there's nothing, there's no mad scientist, there's no physics and chemistry causing and determining your thoughts leading to your beliefs. Um, but I also like to argue that libertarian free will uh, typically means that I have a, I possess the ability to choose between a range of alternative options, each of which is compatible with my image of God nature. And I, and I, I throw an image of God, I can just say with my nature. So I, I have the ability to choose between a range of options, a, a range of alternative options, each of which is compatible with my nature. And so if I only have the ability to choose uh, one, to say that one hypothesis is better than another, and I don't even have the ability to choose the other one, then I don't know for sure. I stand in no epistemic position to know if I really haven't heard the best explanation or not. It's just an assumption. And like I said, that assumption wouldn't be up to me either. So anyway, that's mm -hmm. the problem right there. All right. Uh, Mike has a comment he'd like to address. There's a quick one here. Um, yeah, this uh, is from Wait, Sam. No, let me, let me get this one because it's just right. a quick quick comment, but there's no, it's no response required. Uh, I just want to point out Jamal Khan said, uh, I'm from Pakistan, and I know so many ex-Muslims secretly living a Christian life due to death threats. So keep that in mind, everyone. Uh, there are, there are lots of underground Christians and undercover Christians around the world. And what will be awesome is the one day when they're they're finally... They're finally free to announce that they're Christians, and you're going to see a lot of people in Iran and Pakistan, all these other places, say, "Yep, uh, we're Christians, and we, there's a lot of us here." All right. What? Yeah, this comes from. Uh, it's a question from C. M. Bradley. 
saying, Dr. Lacona, what are your thoughts on Lydia McGrew's new book regarding her reportage model of the literary standards of the Gospels? Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Lydia McGrew, um, she has her work in English literature, but has published also and spent some time studying philosophy and epistemology. And in recent years, she has turned her attention to the Gospels, mainly criticizing me and some others like Craig Keener, Craig Evans, and um, the New, New Testament scholars. Hey, before before everyone gets a negative view of, of Lydia, she is she is uh, she is super insanely smart. Yes, she and is. Uh, I, I happen to like everyone who could be in this conversation. I, I, I love Mike. I love I love Lydia. And, but they have disagreements. And guess what? That that that's kind of okay because they're operating at a scholarly level, and they can they can have disagreements. Um, but but. You know, when you have disagreements like this, someone might be right, someone might be wrong. And what are, what are your thoughts on? Oh, she's on wrong. <laughs> <laughs> now she is smart. Lydia McGrew is wrong. She, yeah, she is wrong. Yep. And she's she is very smart, but there are no shortcuts. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a reason that those of us who have been spending years in this uh, have come to the conclusions that we have. And when you haven't spent as much time in it, you know, that you have a chance of making some errors when now. I have begun. I have begun to read her book, and I'm about 120 some pages into it. And I find that she, when it comes to people like Craig Keener, Craig Evans, Richard Burge, and myself, um, she adopts the least charitable interpretation of what we mean. And there, I've noticed a lot of things. I'm not going to mention specific examples that might come at another time, but there are lots of examples when she's just downright sloppy in the way that she interprets us, in the way that she interprets and pulls together some of the ancient authors and what they're saying. So, uh, like I said, there's no shortcuts. Um, and, you know, read her book with great caution. Um, there's a reason why it's not published by an academic publisher. And she hasn't spent the years and put in the time for this. And it, it, it's really evident in the book to those of us who have. You know, Mike, you're just you're just begging her to respond to this. Oh, now, she'll right? respond, of course. I say one paragraph, she responds in ten pages. Um, well, what if you what if you cram that many errors into what you said in one page, and then so it takes all those pages to unpack all your mistakes? Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. I'm saying you that you just you just like <laughs> my mind. Look, look, the yeah. thing is, I just can't list them. I have to be able to explain. Them. But you know, she's very select and she'll quote some author on one thing, but ignores what he has to say on another thing. It's cherry picking. But the problem is, I don't think she realizes she's cherry picking because she doesn't know the literature well enough. <clears throat> all right. Well, we will expect Lydia's response to all of these slanderous and libelous accusation. <laughs> I forgot the difference between slander and libel. Which one is it? One is written, one is spoken. Which one is it? You guys know slander is spoken, libel is written? Anyway. <laughs> all right. We'll see what happens. Um, one. Look at this. Wait, look, look okay. at this. First of all, look at this. Sam Shimon again. Tatiana, you're here again. So he's going to someone in the, co in the chat on my live stream and says, you're here again, but you won't show up when I'm on? Sam, people don't want to watch your live streams because... You're horrible, right? <laughs> Who wants to watch you, right? Your head looks like a giant melon. <laughs> your arguments are horrible. Who, who's gonna wanna who's gonna watch wanna watch your live stream, Sam? Come on, quit trying to come over here and poach my viewers because no one wants to watch yours. All right, go ahead. Shots fired. All right, go back to uh Tim here. All right, here's one from Fubaris Rex. It says something that bothers me. Does free will necessarily lead to sin eventually? If free will explains evil in this life, how is free will compatible with sin, a sin-free life and the resurrection thoughts? Yes, lots of thoughts on that. Uh, I do encourage you to spend some time on my website, freethinkingministries.com. I've written on this, uh, there's several articles you can find here. Uh, so to answer your first question, does free will necessarily lead to sin eventually? No, it doesn't. Um, but uh, but we know that it has, but it's not necessarily. It hasn't happened necessarily. So free will doesn't guarantee. I mean, uh, I believe that the angels uh, all have free will. Uh, a third of all the angels uh, rejected God, but uh, two-thirds of them didn't. So they had free will, and it didn't necessarily lead to sin. Uh, with humans, though, 
uh, it has led to a separation from God. Uh, so, uh, next question is, if free will explains evil in this life, how is free will compatible with a sin-free life in the resurrection? Well, I believe uh, a lot of this comes down to what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4.17. He says, these light momentary afflictions prepare us for an eternal, uh, for an eternal weight of glory uh, beyond all comparison. Right? Paul's saying that uh, these afflictions and the suffering that we experience in this life prepares us for eternity. So how, how does it prepare us? Well, I think, uh, you know, you look at the, the beings who were created in a suffering-free state of affairs, uh, Adam and Eve and Satan and a third of all the angels, right? They, they took their suffering-free state of affairs for granted and they, they wrecked it, right? They, they wrecked it. And, but you and I are different. We've actually experienced the blessing, and this sounds weird, but the blessing of suffering. And look, I hate suffering, and I've experienced a lot of it this last year. Uh, more, I've experienced moral evil from people. I've experienced a natural evil uh, with my, my knee. I actually went blind in my eye for a while. People are asking what's up with the eye patch in the, in the picture that Dave shared. Yeah, I went blind in my eye for a while uh, in 2019. It was crazy. I thought I was going to lose it. Got it back. It's mostly recovered now. But um, that was pretty funny that I picked the eye patch picture. It, well, you funny. know, it got a lot of attention. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I thought for sure I was going to have to become the eye patch apologist or, or something like that. But uh, you know, we've experienced. You and I have experienced uh, tons of suffering in this planet. And I know that when I'm in the presence of God, like Adam and Eve and Satan and a third of all the angels were, that I'm not going to take. A suffering free state of affairs for granted. I've learned how stupid it is to sin. Uh, I've learned how stupid it is not to follow the commands of Christ. And, you know, I'm, st I'm still, it's still in the process. I'm still learning more, but I've learned that much. And I know that when I'm with Christ, I I'm not going to take that state of affairs for granted. So uh, I've got a short video on my website called Is There Free Will in Heaven? And I believe that uh, free will is vital for a true love relationship, and I believe that, uh, uh, that that true love relationship with God is the essence of salvation. You know, there's nobody in hell that loves Jesus, and there's nobody in heaven that hates him. It's a true love relationship. And, and I've argued on my website that true love requires this libertarian free will, uh, you know, at, at least to resist or not to resist. I mean, I've argued a lot there. But um, if true love requires free will and God's purpose for creating us is a true love relationship with him, and Jesus makes that clear and it's too uh, simple and easy to remember uh, commands to humanity. He tells us, hey, basically it can be boiled down to this. Everybody love God and everybody love everybody, right? It's all about love. It's the objective purpose of life. It's why you exist. And so if, if the purpose that God created us for is to have a true love relationship with him and all people for eternity, then we've got to have free will. For eternity. So how does he guarantee that we don't wreck it like Adam and Eve, Satan, and the third of all the angels did? <laughs> because these light momentary afflictions, Paul says, prepares us for an eternal weight of glory. Hey, I'm just scratching the surface right now, so go to my website and find out more, but great question. Uh, two quick things for you, um, Tim. Uh, mm -hmm. One, Fred Sanford says, wait, is that the Fred Sanford? Do you even know, are you too young to remember Sanford and Son? <laughs> yeah. yeah. You're too young? Uh, you remember yeah. Sanford and Son, oh, right? Yeah. Michael remembers Sanford and Son. I right. think I'm a lot. I'm yeah. older than you. Yeah. <laughs> you big dummy! <laughs> awesome I show. I remember that. Awesome show. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Fred Sanford says, I love that shirt, Free Think or Die. Is, are those like available somewhere? Or oh, is yeah. that where you have the only one? No, uh, you can go to uh, freethinkingministries.com and... Uh, it says uh, FTM swag at the top and click free on thinking, that. That's Free Thinking Ministries swag, the FTM swag on freethinkingministries.com. That's right. That's right. And just uh, again, the uh, the link to uh, both their channels is are in the description box. So you could uh, you could go to his, his channel there. And then he has also links to his uh, to his other sites. But uh, no, Fred Sanford, you can get your own your own free think or die shirt and one for Lamont and another one from Aunt Esther <laughs> and another one from Grady and one more from Julio and one more for Rollo. That's Thanks, right. Fred. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, another one 
Oh, look at this. Would Tim be up to debate James White on Calvinism versus Molinism? Yes. And what? If you debate James White? <laughs> if you're interested, uh, Dr. White, uh, we actually attend the same university, by the way, Northwest University. We're in the, uh, in the same school. Uh, I just submitted my PhD dissertation. And so we're kind of classmates in a sense, you know, we've never actually sat in the same class together. But uh, we're both at, at a reformed university. I consider myself to be reformed. So that might surprise you, and I can uh, defend that position. Um, but I am a Molinist, and I can deductively demonstrate, I believe, that everybody uh, should be, or I can deducti deductively demonstrate that uh, some flavor of Molinism has got to be true. Um, yes, I would gladly have that conversation with James White. And uh, Dr. White was recently on uh, Eli Ayala's show called Revealed Apologetics. And I encourage you to watch that. Eli is a fantastic host. Eli used to be a Molinist and now is a Calvinist. In fact, he says that James White is his theological hero. And, but, but with that said, Eli understands Molinism. He used to be one, right? And he left. Now, I used to be a Calvinist. I used to be a diehard five-point Calvinist. Not only that, I affirmed what, uh, what I described as exhaustive divine determinism, or ED, EDD, exhaustive divine determinism. I didn't just uh, affirm TULIP. I believe that God causally determined everything. When I dropped my pencil or stubbed my toe, thanks a lot, God. Um, you know, I was an extreme Calvinist, uh, not just a Calvinist, but a determinist. Uh, and now I reject that view uh, for several, for many reasons. Um, but Eli, and, and I, we, we start on a different uh, ends of the spectrum and we passed each other in the night. But for, for, a, for a few moments, we were on the same page as we were passing each other. And uh, I love talking to him, but he had Dr. White on his show maybe the week before Christmas. And I was just on his show uh, responding to Dr. White. I gave a two hour response uh, to James White's uh, comments that he made on that show because he really uh, has a poor view, uh, an incorrect view of Molinism. In fact, he attacks a straw man. So I encourage you to watch Eli Ayala's interview with Dr. White and then watch his interview with me. That's going to be the closest thing you're going to get to a debate between the two of us right now, but I would be highly interested in having that mm -hmm. conversation in the future. All right. Um, I'm going to respond to two quick comments and then hand it over to Mike to respond to a couple of comments that are directed towards him. Um, uh, let's see, Karis in the, uh, in the super chat earlier said, uh, how do I talk to an Ahmadi buddy after I read his leader's bogus books? I want to refute them, but I don't want to be rude because he bought me the books. Um, Karis, I was actually in that exact same situation with Nabil. He gave me two books. Uh, I think one was from Mirza Golam Ahmed and one was from another uh, of their leader's um, but uh, for, for anyone who doesn't know what we're talking about, Ahmadis are, uh, they believe in all the five pillars of, of Islam. They believe in, you know, the basics of Islam, but they believe, they have a different view of end times. They believe, so Muslims are required to believe in the second coming of Jesus. Ahmadis believe that it already happened in the person of Mirza Ghulam Ahmed. So they believe that, that, that Jesus already returned as this one guy. So they listen to that guy. Um, and, and so the, the, the situation is, these books contain some of the stupidest arguments you've ever heard in your entire life. Uh, massive sections of the book is just bragging about how brilliant the arguments are. And then the arguments are some of the silliest things you've ever read in your entire life. So one of the arguments was, if God were a trinity, then planets would be shaped like triangles and not, and not, like, not like spheres. Because a sphere emphasizes oneness, whereas a triangle would emphasize three in oneness. And therefore, if God were a triune, he would make planets like triangles. And so those are the kinds of arguments. And then the rest of it is bragging, bragging about how brilliant the arguments are and so on. So the question is, how would you, how would you point these things out without upsetting the person? Unfortunately, Nabil was pretty open to me just being absolutely savage in my criticisms and so on. If you're worried about offending your, your buddy, um, a few weeks ago, I recommended a book called Tactics by Greg Kokel. And I'll be having Greg on a live stream here pretty soon uh, to talk about this. But basically, I would say you could... You can bring up sensitive information and very sensitive points in a non-confrontational, non-aggressive way. And this can be like the most sensitive. So if you wanted to bring up Muhammad and Aisha, right, just, just, just to give you an extreme example. If you wanted to bring up the fact that Muhammad had sex with a nine-year-old girl with your Muslim friend, right? Now, you could do this in a way that's going to make him not want to talk to you anymore. 
Or you could do it in a, in a, in a gentler way by saying, uh, hey, I was reading this article and uh, in the article, uh, it, it, it quoted some Muslim sources saying that Muhammad had sex with a nine-year-old girl. Um, you know, I have to admit that, that this bothers me. Uh, I was wondering if you could look through it and you could give me your perspective as a Muslim, because I just don't want to you know, believe the, the conclusions of the person who's writing the article. I'd like your input. There you're requesting information, right? So it helps to kind of how you, how you frame the information. So if you find a really bad argument that you, you want the person to know about, you could come to them like that and say, hey, you know, you bought me the books. I'm, 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 I'm thankful to you for, for getting me these books. But I was reading right here in this chapter and I was wondering uh, what you think of this argument, because the, the argument sounds very strange to me, uh, you know, and, and I'm wondering if, it, if you really think that it's good. And maybe you could explain. I must be missing something here. I don't see how his conclusion follows. Could, could you explain that? And so you bring up the exact same point that you would bring up if you just said, hey, this is stupid, but you do it in a gentler way and that 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 hopefully wouldn't uh, wouldn't wouldn't run someone off. So just focus on using more questions. Again, if you can get a copy of Greg Kokel's book Tactics, uh, I would recommend that. Um, and also uh, watch the watch the upcoming live stream that I'll have with Greg, because uh, the, the message is kind of geared towards is kind of geared towards um, that sort of thing and not not driving someone away or, or, or upsetting them. So uh, one more quick, uh, Hattie, I'm not going to answer the question here. I'm going to respond. But Hattie in the super chat says, hello, brothers in Christ. Can we please go through the vision of Daniel about the son of man and how Jesus referred to himself as the son of man? So for anyone who doesn't know what we're talking about in the book of Daniel, uh, chapter seven, uh, we read about someone like the son of man who came with the clouds of heaven and he was going to uh, receive uh, the sort of service that is only due to God by all peoples of, in, in, in all nations and so on. And so he seems to be a divine figure, uh, but he's approaching the ancient of days, who also is a divine figure. And Jesus at his trial, was, at his Jewish trial, is actually, that's what they were pointing to, right? When he said he's the son of man coming with the clouds of heaven, that's what they said, you have to die. You have to die for, for this sort of blasphemy. And the reason this is important is Muslims point to son of man. They say, oh, he's saying he's the son of man not realizing he's claimed to be a very specific son of man who was divine and that this was considered blasphemous by the Jewish leader. So uh, the reason we're not going to go through the entire passage is uh, I've been wanting to make a video on that for a while. So, uh, Hedy, uh, if you do not see me uh, here, uh, at least by the end of February, I make a video on that. Go ahead and remind me and I'll get to it because it's, 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 it's an important topic. All right, Mike, you got some questions you would like yeah, to respond to here. Let's see from Abu Bakr Ghazali says, can Michael Kona prove Muhammad is not a prophet? Well, let me just give you some something for your consideration. Um, Jesus, it, it seems historically certain that Jesus uh, predicted his death. All right. So we find this in Mark chapter eight, Mark chapter nine, Mark chapter 14. Uh, you find it several times throughout the gospel of Mark. So and that's our first, probably our first gospel written. We also find it in what we would call the Q material in Matthew and Luke. That's material that's common to Matthew and Luke, but is absent from Mark. Um, it could be that Luke got it from Matthew or Matthew got it from Luke or that they got it from a common source. Um, that's what they call Q if they think it was a common source. But either way, it's a tradition that is uh, comes independently of the Gospel of Mark. We also find it in the Gospel of John in John chapter 2. Um, he's predicting his death. Uh, so you, you've got it. It's in multiple indie, independent accounts. Jesus predicting his death. And there's other reasons I could give for believing that it is um, historically likely, it's historically probable that, uh, that Jesus predicted his imminent death. And when I, I say imminent death, because the Quran says that he would, he will be killed when he returns in the second coming. So I say imminent death, that is in the first century. Jesus was predicting it. Now, we've got one of two options here. Jesus died or he did not die as he predicted. If he died as he predicted, then the Quran is mistaken when it says in Surah, what is it, 4, um, that God only made it look as though Jesus died. Um, he made it appear that he died, but he took him to heaven. So if Jesus did not die, uh, then that would have made him a false prophet. But the Quran says he's a good prophet. He was a great prophet, okay? So the Quran would be wrong about Jesus as a great prophet if Jesus didn't die. On the other hand, if Jesus did die as he predicted, the Quran is mistaken in, in so far as when it says that he, God only made it appear that he did. Either way, the Quran is mistaken. So 
Uh, I think the only way that you can really get out of that is to say, well, Muhammad, or, uh, Jesus did not predict his death, but we've got lots of historical evidence that he did. I mean, you can go to my website. Uh, it, it, it's in my books, but you can go to my website, risenjesus.com. I've got an article on it there. So if you say that Jesus did not predict his imminent death, then you have to give some historical reasons why. Not just quoting a book <clears throat> that it claims to be divinely inspired that was written more than it was written 600 years after Jesus' death. Give me some historical reasons. Right? You have to uh, account for all those things, that all the reasons to think that he did predict his imminent death. So if he did predict his death, it would seem, well, you're going to have to determine for yourself whether you think Muhammad was a true prophet of God when the Quran has such things in it. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll just add to that that... Uh, um, <clears throat> So Mike pointed out that we have historical evidence that Jesus predicted his own death. Uh, we have the predictions recorded. Um, By the way, in, it's on my Gospels. YouTube channel. Uh, on my YouTube channel, there's a video that says crucifixion or crucifixion. Mm -hmm. And that explains mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. I, would add, uh, I would add that if the Muslim wants to take the route that, that Mike uh, said was, if he wanted a way out, he could argue that Jesus didn't say that, and therefore that the Gospels are, are wrong. The additional problem that he runs into was the Quran affirms not only the initial inspiration of the Christian sources, but also the uh, the preservation and the the authority. Right. So the uh, in in Surah seven verse one fifty seven, uh, Allah says that during the time of Muhammad, Christians still had the gospel and were reading the gospel. Um, if you look at how the gospel is used from the second century onward, they refer to the fourfold gospel. The gospel would be, would either re refer, you, you could have the gospel as in terms of a message, right? Like preaching the gospel. If they're talking about a text you uh, you would read, they refer to, the, from the second century on, they treated the four gospels as a unit called the fourfold gospel. Uh, but basically it's affirming what the Christians were reading from the first century down to the seventh century. When we even look at Muslims, when they try to show that, that Muhammad is mentioned in the Gospels, because that's what the Quran says, where do they go? They go to our, our Gospels that we, that we have now. So they're the Gospels that were preserved by Christians and were still being read by Christians that are affirmed by the Quran. So if you want to say that the Gospels we have are corrupted, when the Quran says that they were inspired by Allah, they say that no one, the Quran says that no one can change the words of Allah, and that Christians were still reading the word of Allah as the Gospel, and that Christians had to judge by the gospel. If you want to say the gospel is something other than the gospel that we have, then Allah is telling us to judge by something that we don't have. And so the only way to make sense of the Quran saying that we still have the gospel and that we're supposed to judge by the gospel is that the Quran is affirming the gospel that we have. And so if you want to say that the prophecies, I mean, Jesus prophesying his own, his own imminent death are wrong in the gospels, then your problem isn't just with history. Your problem is with Islam as well, and with the Quran, and with Muhammad. And so, guys, there's just no way out of this, right? History affirms history affirms that Jesus uh, made these predictions about himself. The Quran affirms the sources that record these predictions. So if you want to deny that Jesus made these predictions, then you're, you're kind of going against both history and your own, your own book, and you're, gonna, you're just going to have some problems there. All right, what do you guys think? Shall we be wrapping up here? Uh, there, there's one more real quick. We'll go, we'll go with this. Um, what is your opinion of open theism? Let's it's go for false. Any. What? It's false. How can you yeah. know that? The, 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 only resp the only alternative would be closed. Clo you're not closed-minded, are you? <laughs> I'm open-minded. In fact, I'm open to considering arguments for open theism. I think the arguments are lacking. I think the arguments uh, for mental knowledge are quite strong. And I don't see good reason to think open theism is true. Um, but, you know, if I could add to that, I uh, talk about Molinism a little bit, and somebody has uh, asked, what is Molinism? Uh, just really quickly, you know, and, and I mentioned James White on Eli's show on Revealed Apologetics, and, and Eli asked him to define uh, Molinism, and he said it, it would take too long, and so he wasn't really going to do it. But let me tell you, you can do it in just a few seconds. Um, I is this define, something about which you're passionate? No, I don't really care about Molinism, okay. just but, about you know, this. I just know a little bit about it. But uh, mere Molinism is, is what I like to call, or it, it, it entails two essential ingredients or two uh, pillars, if you will, and that's this, that one, logically prior to God's decision to create the world, 
God knew everything that would happen in any possible scenario he could create. And this entails God's mental knowledge. And two, as beings created in the image of God, humans, like God, possess libertarian freedom, which, uh, like I said, a lot of times I defend these. Uh, there's several definitions of libertarian freedom. I, I affirm all of them uh, that I'm aware of. But the one I specifically like to defend is the ability to choose between a range of options, each compatible with one's nature. And so that's mere Molinism right there. If you believe that logically prior to God's decision to create the world, that God knew everything that would happen in any possible scenario that he could create, then God's got middle knowledge. And if you believe that humans uh, are created in the likeness and image of God and possess the ability to choose between a range of options, each of which is compatible with our image of God nature, then some flavor of Molinism's got to be true. So uh, I argue uh, deductively for both middle knowledge, that, that God possesses middle knowledge, and that humans possess uh, at least a limited libertarian freedom. And that's all you need for Molinism to be true. Um, all right, should we go ahead and wrap up now? Sure. Hmm? Um, wait a second. I'm trying to see this comment. Uh, let's go ahead and answer this real quick. Interesting question. Uh, Mike, isn't it the case that experience doesn't significantly weigh against Christ's resurrection? I'm not sure what he means by this. Um, I'm not sure if he means, uh, like, you know, of course, Craig Keener's uh, two-volume work on miracles. He points out that, um, well, just, just backing up, the, the, the main response for the past couple centuries to... Uh, the idea of a miracle or Jesus rising from the dead <clears throat> comes from David Hume, who argued that since there's uh, a uniform human experience against miracles, we go, we go through life all day and uh, we don't see any miracles. Then when someone comes along and claims that someone has risen from the dead, well, all of our experience tells us that that's not the case. All of our experience tells us that that's not the case. That sort of thing doesn't happen. If 100% if if of people who die stay dead, then there's uniform human experience against uh, Jesus' resurrection. And therefore, I'm sorry, I just can't believe what you're saying if you tell me that a man has, has risen from the dead. Now, there are all kinds of problems uh, with that. One, you, you, could, you, you should never believe anything unique that happens in experience if, uh, mm -hmm. if, it, if it's the only, if it's the only uh, example of, it, of its kind. Uh, so notice, fo following this, following this, you should reject the atheist's claim that life formed on its own, right? Because wait a minute, we you know doesn't it doesn't right. keep happening. Well, it's all of our experience tells us that doesn't doesn't happen. Why would you believe that, right? Um, but one additional problem with it is where are you getting the idea that there's universal universal uh, human experience ag against miracles? That there's uniform uh, human experience. Uh, Craig Keener has got a two volume set on miracles, and there was a, a study by Pew Research where they went to uh, one denomination in 10 countries. There are just 10 countries out of the world, one Christian denomination, and they started accumulating data on how many people believed that they had seen, had, had per personally witnessed a miracle, and they were already in the hundreds of millions, right? So there were hundreds of millions of people in, in, in one Christian denomination in just 10 countries. So if you, if you do the math, it's probable that there are more than a billion people in the world who believe that they've witnessed a miracle. So if you're an atheist, every last one of those billion people have to be wrong about something they claim to have witnessed. Um, so that, that would be my thoughts on uh, experience not weighing against Christ's resurrection. Uh, do you have a different direction you'd go or, or what are you thinking? Well, that'd be one of the directions I'd go, certainly. Just like you pointed out, there are plenty of people who've experienced miracles. I've experienced miracles. I know others who have experienced miracles. So One, one second, one second. How many of you, uh, going along with that, how many of you in the chat believe that you've actually witnessed a miracle? Just let us know in the chat. But go ahead. Yeah, so that would be one thing. It, it just goes against facts. Uh, there are a lot of people who have experienced miracles. Um, second, I think uh, Hume's argument is just is um, uh, in this, is misstated the way he states it. So, so it's like a balancing argument. He will say uh, the if you look at the evidence for Jesus's resurrection. OK, first of all, you've got natural law and natural law would say that when a corpse dies, it's going to stay dead. It's not coming back to life. 
and we observe this with an exceptionist regularity. The evidence that we have that Jesus rose from the dead is human testimony, and human testimony can be quite reliable. It can also be quite unreliable. In any sense, it does not have the same exceptionalist regularity of being correct as we find with natural law that shows that when a corpse dies, it's going to stay dead, it's not coming back to life. And so on balance, you've got to go with the weight of the evidence, and that pushes against uh, what, what human testimony is saying, and it goes with natural law. So the way I would address that is to say, well, it is misconstrued, the argument itself, because we would all agree that when a corpse dies, it's going to stay dead. It's not coming back to life if it's left to itself. All right. But if God exists and wants to raise that body, well, then that all bets are off. God's the game changer. And so it's not the same argument anymore. So if someone said, let's say, uh, what's the probability of someone walking on water? And you take, let's say there's 7 billion people in the world, and you take all but one, and they try to walk on water, whether it's a swimming pool, a lake, a river, an ocean, sea, whatever, and they can't do it, they all sink. And finally, the last person is a four-year-old uh, boy, and he says, well, I can't do it, and we take him to a swimming pool, I hold his hands, suspend his weight over the water, and I walk alongside the swimming pool, and he walks on water. Um, well, the fact that he walks on water was seven billion people who couldn't walk on water unassisted hmm. says nothing pertaining to whether someone could walk on water assisted. It's just in a different reference class. And it's the same thing with Jesus. Seven billion people not coming back from the dead, their corpses stay, or a hundred billion people over estimated over the history of the human race, a hundred billion people not coming back to life by natural causes says nothing pertaining to whether God could raise someone from the dead. So Hume's argument is misconstrued. Um, I don't see any reason for taking that balancing argument. I think it fails. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Now check these out. Guys, correct me if I'm wrong, but when you type one as an answer to a question, that means yes. Is that correct? Let's just get that. Uh, hmm? I don't know. Well, I, I saw a sure. bunch of ones. Oh, I see okay. people doing that on certain channels. I'm assuming, I, I just wanted to verify that one means uh, yes. Is that because correct? Typing two extra characters is too hard. Yeah. Yeah. yeah tell us it. Yeah. Okay. Or so yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, Mitch there says uh, one equals yes. All right. All right. So let's go ahead. So so we asked, by the way, how many of you, and there are, there are a little under uh, 700 people watching right now. So we asked, how many of you? I uh, believe that you have personally witnessed a miracle. Let's go ahead and uh, check these out here as we, and then we'll close out. Uh, Kara says, I did. Uh, mustard seed. Um, mustard seed says one. So that's a yes. Um, Joe Schmo says me. Um, the free lie in your death said 10,000. I don't know if you mean 10,000 miracles, wow. uh, but uh, that'd, be, that'd be a lot. Uh, side note, uh, SD11 and crew said, let me organize a debate between you and Dr. Zucker Knight. Deal. I agree here. Uh, see if he does. Uh, FB said, I did. Stud Muffin said, uh, one. Just me said, I have. Um, <clears throat> uh, Robert says he had a, uh, had a vision of nine. Uh, uh, Robert said, I had a vision of 9-11 on the 10th. Uh, Renee said, yes. Rose said, yes. Um, Robert said, yes. Ursa said, me. <laughs> Cheryl said one, so yes. Um, Candace said, I've witnessed several miracles. Skeeter Lee says, I have. Ham Sunshine said, yes. Um, Psalm 116, I witnessed miracles. Susan says, experienced at least two miracles right off the top of my head. Kent, I have. Laura Lee put her hand up. Um, Dave said, I've definitely my, uh, Dave said, I've definitely myself witnessed a miracle. Um, now why, uh, Chris said, um, not yet, but check out what's going on here. Uh, all the wiser said, yep. Uh, Viber said zero miracles here. 
Pete said, yes, multiple supernatural experiences. Uh, Shawnee, I have. Texas Toast, I have. James Payne says, yes. Uh, Julian, yes. Samuel, me several times. Glenn says, have witnessed miracle. Black Angel, yep. Sophia, yep. Super M, I have. Suze, yep. Healings plus personal salvation was just amazing. <laughs> and what says, yep. Salasin said, uh, yes, many times, a few myself experienced for myself. This is interesting. Andrew Martin says, I'm an atheist and I've had lots of miracles and I've even done them too. Uh, that's an interesting. Uh, Bhaktivar said, uh, I have not. Uh, Marion said, I survived something that should have killed me. Is that a miracle? Well, I mean, it depends, right? You can, you can be sick and, you know, statistically you should die, but you don't. And that could just be your immune system um, or it, it can be a miracle. So I'd have to ignore info. Lisa says, yes, the school said, maybe. Uh, Inc. 70 says, me many times to the Muslims in the chat. Uh, Tesfaye says, yep. Darkwing Duck says, I have. I'm guessing two means no. So Pan Aggie says, no. Uh, Joel said, I saw a friend healed of a generated disc in his lower back publicly. Um, Greg J says, me. Salty is very salty because uh, he says, I've never witnessed a miracle. Um, Trust Jesus said, uh, I was saved, but that's not what you mean. I know. Uh, Nuxa said, me, I have experienced two miracles. And Time Prophecy says, yep. Um, Stubba Dub said, I have had statistically improbable prayers answered, if that counts as a miracle. Uh, Linda says, yep. Michelle says, I have experienced a miracle, Act 17 Apologetics. I, uh, Jude says, I've experienced divine love of Christ. AZ Farmer says, uh, yes, I've seen a miracle. My wife died for 20 minutes in a hospital and then woke up. Wow. Um, <clears throat> Joseph said, just last year, I experienced a miracle. RMS, uh, I have. Choose Jesus, uh, I have. Um, Les Douglas says, yep. Uh, and so... You, and by the way, these these uh, a lot of these keep 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 going on. I'm just scrolling down. Uh, I have a man felt power moving along his legs, and his legs did not hurt anymore. Um, so we it's have almost an infinite. Yeah, it, it keeps going. Notice <laughs> this is this is 700 people watching, and how many people believe they've witnessed a miracle? Uh, it seems like well over 100, right? So add me to the list. Add you to the list. Yeah. And so, guys, uh, th that's that's one of the main problems. That's one of the main problems with Hume's claim that there's this uniform experience against miracles. There are people all over the place who believe they've, they've, uh, they've witnessed miracles. So, yep. All right. We're going to go ahead and wrap up. Now we are planning, uh, since we're going to be down here for a couple of days, we are planning to go live again uh, tomorrow and on Wednesday as well. Uh, we have a couple of topics that we're um, interested in covering. But uh, if there's anything else you'd like us to cover, go ahead and put those in the chat and I mean in the uh, in the comments after we're done, and we'll see if we can work those in. Uh, final thoughts, Tim, for anyone out there. Dave, I want to thank you for introducing Mike and I to your YouTube friends. It's an honor and appreciate your friendship, brother. Mm -hmm. Mike, yeah, any final thanks, thoughts for everyone? Yeah, thanks for joining us tonight, and uh, thanks for having us on, Dave. And Dave and I go way, 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 way back. Way yeah, so, back. But, hey, thanks for allowing us to uh, come into your living room, dining room, yeah. wherever tonight. Nice to spend some time with you. God bless you. All right. Uh, Swordfish, as we're wrapping out, uh, I'm not sure what apologetics is. Uh, apologetics is basically giving a, a, a rational defense for what you believe. So it comes derived from a Greek word that was a, a term in court uh, where your defense your defense of your client was called your speech that you would give was called your your apologia. So it's your 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 defense uh, of the claims. And so uh, the the apostle uh, Peter adapts it in First Peter three fifteen, and uh, he uses it to say that the Christians always need to be ready to give a defense for uh, for the hope that we have. So 
that's what we do. Uh, but but guess what? All Christians are called to do that. And so, mm -hmm. guys, uh, not all of you need to be uh, full time apologists, but all Christians should be apologists. You should be able to give people reasons for what you believe. You believe. Uh, in God, you believe that Jesus died on the cross for sins and rose from the dead. Uh, biblically, you're supposed to be able to give a defense for that. So that's what we're here for. That's what we're here for. That's what lots of other people are out there for. Because if you can't, then it's good to learn. All right. Lord willing, see you all tomorrow. God bless everyone.